Hi guys, I hope you are well. Wanted to go over an article that I saw. It didn't really pop up on my news feed or when I was doing research, but I listened to a recent podcast on Real Vision, the Real Vision uh, podcast, an episode with Neil Howe, I believe is his name. He's the author of The Fourth Turning. And I found it fascinating. One of the things he pointed out when asked, when asked about the divisiveness that we have in the United States right now, uh, I believe Ed Harrison was interviewing him and he said, you know, something to the effect of, have we ever seen anything like this in the United States? And the, he said, well, we've seen it twice in U.S. history. One was just before the Civil War, and hence the title of this video. And the other, I believe, was right around the, uh, the Revolution. And so his point was every time in American history where we've got to this fever pitch, where the powder keg has gotten this unstable, it, it usually leads to a, a conflict of some sort between the, the parties involved. So I know it's kind of hyperbolic to use the term civil war when referring to something that may happen or could happen in the United States. So I kind of, I hesitate to, to do it, but I, I think that if you study history and you just honestly assess where the U.S. is right now and where we will be in the future from the standpoint of our society, and you layer over that everything that has changed that will most likely make us even more divisive in the future, you've got to come to the conclusion that the probability is greater than zero that we do go to some sort of civil war. I mean, whatever that looks like, I, I, who knows? And I actually talked to Doug Casey about this a few months ago, and this is something that he mentioned. But let's go to this article on the fourth turning. So a book published nearly 25 years ago predicted America would hit a great crisis climaxing around 2020, and that up next is a millennial versus boomer standoff that will usher in a new world order. So the bullet points, America sees a turning every 20 years as one generation displaces another. And the dynamic between one particular generation entering elderhood and another entering young adulthood creates a crisis every 80 years. According to a theory prophesized, prophesied, I think I'm pronouncing it right, in Neil Howe and William Strauss, The Fourth Turning. The authors wrote that the next crisis era would start around 2005 and climax around 2020 and would involve millennials and boomers fighting over the shape of the world to come. And I think it, it, this may or may not be true, but you've got to add to that the, the political parties. I mean, that's, that's where I think you're getting really some, some religious-like uh, divisiveness. There are similarities between recent events and books predictions. The 2008 financial crisis can be seen as a catalyst they mentioned, and in 2020 and early 2021, unrest has shaken the economy, polit politics, and society. It's unclear whether the fourth turning has how Strauss cared. Ca it's unclear whether the fourth turning, as how and Strauss characterized it, really is happening right now. But parallels are certainly eye-catching.
A great crisis in 2008 followed by an even greater one in 2020 as an authoritarian, severe, unyielding leader from the baby boomer generation resists a historic moment of change of foot in the U.S. Huh, wow. They said that in the fourth turn. I didn't realize that. That's pretty crazy. Oh, shoot. I wish they had more on what he was saying. So then they just go on to say, is this a pseudoscience or is this legit? Talk about Trump. Okay, so they don't really go into the detail that I was hoping they would go into and where they talk about how the the amount, now that Neil obviously written the book, now he's being interviewed, he's looking back in retrospect, he is saying that this is truly unprecedented or has only been seen a few times in the United States and it's led to conflict, severe conflict. So one of the reasons I think he says there's this divide between the millennials and the baby boomers is it's also a divide between the haves and the have nots and that the baby boomers were had the, the fortunate, I guess, luck, if you will, to grow up in a time when, when they were adults, there's a 40 year down cycle in interest rates. Mortgages got increasingly less expensive. Housing prices go up, stocks go up, bonds go up. Every asset class has gone up as a result of those interest rates going down and other things since 1981. So now they retire. And by the way, they're getting a lot of the social security, a lot of the transfer payments go to the baby boomer generation. Their average life expectancy has increased significantly, yet the age at which they can receive these benefits has remained the same. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's a topic for a completely different video. It is what it is. That's why you've got so much of the wealth concentrated in the baby boomer generation. It's one of the reasons. But then the millennials are like, what about us? And that's you get this back and forth and back and forth. Well, I think that's one component. But like I said, when you look at kind of the hypothesis I've had for maybe the last year, and that's we've kind of abandoned the focal point of our society being religion. And back when I was growing up, it was, it was more, our society as a whole was more centered around religion and church. And again, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, that's good or bad. You can have your own, uh, come to your own conclusion there. But the bottom line is that we as human beings need some sort of meaning in our lives. We're, we're very tribal. And if you eliminate the religion from the equation, which is happening in our society to a greater degree, we're going to fill it with something. And I think a lot of people have filled the void with politics. That's their new religion. And I think, honestly, a lot of people in the gold and the Bitcoin community <laughs> have, 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 that's their religion. So when you combine that with what Neil Howe is, is talking about, you then have to look at what the future looks like. Okay, well, the Fed and the government have built an economy that completely revolves around asset prices continually going up. If asset prices go down, the whole economy implodes. You guys get it. I'm preaching to the choir. So who holds the assets? It's the baby boomers. So if you continually have to increase asset prices, by definition, you continually have to increase 
the purchasing power or the wealth of the baby boomer generation. If those asset prices continue to go up, the more they go up, the harder it is for the millennials to buy those assets, which they need to get ahead in life, because now the real economy pretty much revolves or is lifted up by the financial economy. It's the tail wagging the dog. You see, so it, it, it's it's the easiest way to make money right now is just go buy call options on GameStop. That's what I'm talking about. You see, instead of when I was growing up, there was none of that talk. It's just, how do you make a lot of money? You go out there, work your ass off and start a business creating goods and services. Period. That's how you do it. So we, we now have this complete shift in the mindset where it's kind of viewed as the only way to really get ahead or the best way to get ahead in life is to own assets, to own stocks, to own bonds, to own real estate. Right back when I was growing up, even in the even this was after the 70s, it's, it wasn't really about that. It was about saving money. And, and now I think people instinctively realize that if they save money, they're never going to get ahead. And that's unfortunate because I don't mean to go off on a topic but or off on a tangent, but in a deflationary environment, we, we would not have those problems and therefore those economic distortions. We would have proper incentives set up from the beginning. But my point is in order for the government and the Fed to maintain this illusion of prosperity that we've created through financial markets and asset bubbles, they're going to have to enrich, in other words, exacerbate and widen the wealth gap we already have. And if the wealth gap increases to a greater degree than what we see right now, what does that do to uh, social unrest? What does that do to the fabric of society? So I don't even know, honestly, what a civil war would look like. I mean, I don't even, you kind of go back to the certain states believe one thing and other, but I, I don't really, I mean, we don't really see that now. It, I, I don't, I don't see how this plays out, frankly. I'm, I'm really trying to think it through. Um, it's, it's just, maybe you have a, I don't know, maybe, maybe you have a civil war from the standpoint of just con constant conflict between certain groups of individuals in the United States. Maybe that's how it plays out, where you, you, where this continues to escalate and escalate and escalate till maybe we get to violence. Hopefully we don't, but maybe we get to, to some violent point where the, the haves are fighting the have-nots and the have-nots are rioting and looting in the street um, maybe that's what it looks like because there's no kind of statewide belief system that we had back in the last civil war. I don't know. I don't know. The, the one thing I, I, the, the one conclusion I have come to is the probability of this degenerating and getting worse is uh, pretty darn high. And so I think it's something that we need to be prepared for, not only financially, but personally as well, with setting up uh, a plan B and just having options, especially if you live in an urban type of environment.
Okay, guys, I want to make an announcement that I have done like a, I guess it's kind of like a sponsorship deal or an affiliate deal. And you guys know I don't really uh, do a lot of these <laughs> things. I don't, in fact, I don't know if I've ever had a sponsor. I'm trying to think. I don't think I have. Hmm. But anyway, it's because I, I don't really, I don't. I get tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of sponsorship offers, but uh, I don't like really doing business with people I don't know. And you know, I'm in a position where I don't really need to do business with people I don't know, so it's 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 fortunate. But I do know Lynette Zhang, and Lynette is a great friend of mine, and I think she is one of the most fantastic people I have ever met. So when her people came to me and said, hey, George, we'd like to kind of sponsor the channel, uh, if that's the right word, I said, absolutely. I'll do anything that I can to help uh, Lynette because I think she is just a wonderful, wonderful human being. So uh, I'm going to put in the description a link to her gold deal. So if you guys are thinking about buying gold, and what makes uh, Lynette's company unique is um, it's more of a white glove service where it's not just, hey, I want to buy some gold. It's, it's they set up, they talk to you, they get to know you, they have a, like a personal advisor that they, that they give you. And that personal advisor goes over like this game plan based on what your objectives are as far as, you know, what types of precious metals that you should be involved with. So it's, it's, it's much more of a white glove, hands-on uh, kind of VIP type of service. So if you're looking for that, a lot of people aren't, they just want the cheapest gold or whatever. And that's totally cool. I get it. But if you're looking for that type that hands-on professionalism, then I would uh, strongly suggest uh, checking out Lynette and, and her company. And I think you always should buy gold at any price, uh, as long as you're buying it for insurance. You know the 10-80-10 portfolio that I always talk about. So again, if you're in the market for gold, if you want that type of service, we'll put a link in the description below. And moving forward on a lot of these live streams, I'll probably just include that link and just reference it every once in a while. Okay. And actually, I think I've got it. Maybe I'll put it in the chat right here. I think I've got it. I can paste it. Yeah, there we go. All right, let's do some shout outs. We've got High Kick X. Oh, what happened? High Kick X. Where'd you go? High Kick X. <laughs> Red Sly Fox 88. Patrick Coleman. Ken Long. Ron Gustavus. Gustavesson. Gustavesson. I know I'm saying that wrong. Gustav. Gust. How should I pronounce that? Ron Gustavesson. Gustavesson. Maybe that's it. Gustavesson. Suzanne the Patriot, born like stars. Her name must stay life. Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk. Nerwin Aguilar. Anil Rye, Pork Barrel Investing, J Crypto Gold Silver. Oh, we got Moody. It skipped on me. Moody, I saw you. Moody the Millennial in the house. The Angriest Puppy, Scott. Horechka, Copper Backpack, Stella Q, Peter Frauen, Louis Rea, Black Tusk Productions. Julio Perez, Robert Jolife, Jean Imparato, David Charlesworth, Clint Eastborn. Trying to work on my pronunciation. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your evening. Make sure you check out the George Gammon channel tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern. The video. Let me see. I had the title right here. I was working on it this morning. You'd think I'd remember the title. Is inflation here to stay or is it transitory? I answer this question on tonight's whiteboard video.
You got to check it out. George Gammon channel, 9 p.m. Eastern. You guys have a good evening. We'll see you on the next video.